Well, thank you for joining us in thanks today and for uh, expressing your gratitude to the Lord for his many blessings. When, when you get up and you do that, you obviously, uh, you just can't remember and can't say everything. Um, and so I was sitting down and I was like, well, golly, what about, what about like the sound team? You know, those, nobody talks to the sound team until something goes wrong. You ever notice that? Guys, we love you. And so many others, those who serve on boards, those who serve on committees, those who, uh, who serve in, in those uh, important roles, those who are officers uh, of the church, so many people putting their hands in. Um, Kathy took a moment to thank those that have been working with the student ministry, but for, for a number of years, um, Brendan and Kathy um, worked with our students and, and poured into their lives, and um, we appreciate that and uh, the goodly heritage that, that comes behind us that, it, that it's being built on. And so, uh, so we're just very grateful. We're grateful as a church, we're grateful as a people uh, for the blessings of God. Let me invite you to take out uh, your uh, message guide this morning. And in some sense, the uh, message has already been given. Uh, you kind of gave the message this morning, a message of thanks for God's goodness, but we're gonna take a few moments and reflect on God's word, and I'm gonna try to do this. Uh, uh, expediently but and succinctly um, and so uh, we've got uh, a, a fair bit to say and uh, and we're gonna do the same so uh, we're gonna uh, move forward this morning let me invite you to take out your Bible if you have it with you Psalm 107 uh, if you'd like to use the Bible that's available in the seat there it's page um, 539 and you can follow along in that way well, we are looking forward to Thanksgiving this week. Uh, I'm looking forward to spending some time with my family. Uh, my son and his wife are coming up from Dallas. They're gonna meet in New Jersey with us and we're gonna be with my family there. Um, and, uh, and so we're looking forward to that. But uh, beyond that, Thanksgiving is kind of uh, a, a holiday, if you would, that's become renowned for its food, hasn't it? Uh, it's, you know, it's about the turkey and the dressing and the, the mashed potatoes and the, all of those other things, and maybe you have a particular thing that you pre prepare for your family. One of the things you think about when it comes to the Thanksgiving meal is how many things that are vegetables that are supposed to be good for you that all of a sudden become not good because they're prepared for Thanksgiving. Like sweet potatoes are supposed to be good for you, but all of a sudden they become like a dessert because you put those candied nuts on top and you put the marshmallows on top and you drizzle a little maple syrup maybe on top or you s slam the butter on there and you put it in the oven and it comes out and it's like candy. And you're like, how in the world? I thought this was supposed to be good, it, but it's, what, I, I, this can't be good for you. It can't be good. You know, we, we, you know, we would say that food is good. Food's good, we would say that. Uh, it tastes good to us. Uh, it tastes good from my perspective. One of the things that was really hard growing up in my home was my dad was a chef. And my dad, my, my dad didn't have a lot of filters, if you know what I mean. He, he just kind of said what he said. And, you know, so if something didn't taste right or didn't taste good, he was not shy. He would tell you, this doesn't taste good. And it was, I mean, I grew up, my, my mother couldn't cook a chicken because it just was never cooked right. Watered, boiled water just wasn't right. There was nothing right. But we, from our perspective, some things are good, other things are not good. And that was really tough. I can't tell you how many meals ended up in our backyard because of frustration and issues and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, was, it was hard. You know, but we look at, you know, boy, but this week, food's good. Food's good. We, we, we think about that. We, we also might say of someone else, they are good. They're good. They, maybe they're good at something. They're good at, at accomplishing a particular thing, doing a particular thing. Uh, they're, they're good at 
fixing things. They have a particular skill or a particular ability. Uh, they're, they're good at, at, they're able to study. Academically, they excel. They are good at school. Um, you know, they are good at this or that. And um, it, it was funny, just, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, one of our ladies came in the church and was getting some things and I was here at the church working, it was in the afternoon. And um, uh, they were, you know, we, we just kind of chatted very briefly. And so they said, is there anything I can help you with? And I said, well, if you would like to, uh, you know, teach my class or, you know, preach my message or whatever, yeah, but I'm really, other. and they're like, oh, no, no, I can't do that. That's not for me, you know, kind of thing. And, and, and so, you know, there are things that you just have to do, and there are things that people are good at. And there are other things that people maybe are not so much given, they're good at other things. People can be good at something. But when we talk about God being good, which is where we're going this morning, when we talk about the goodness of God, we're not only describing what he does, what is good, but we are saying that he is good. He doesn't only do good things, but he is good. God is good. Look at our scripture passage for this morning. It is Psalm 107, as I said, page 539. And this is just verses um, one and two of that Psalm. And the Psalmist says this, he says, "'Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, "'for his mercy endures forever. "'Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, "'which you have already done this morning, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. God's love is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He is good. It is a statement about his character, about his essence, about his person, that not only does he good, do good things, but he himself is good. And the redeemed of the Lord are to say so. Those who have been redeemed by the love of God, the care of God, the, the heart of God. I, I, I'm just, I love the verse that Sean shared from Romans chapter eight, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still away from him, while we were still doing things that displeased him, while, was, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his son for us. What an amazing reminder. To think that in all of my brokenness, that even after coming to Christ still continues, that he still loves me when I, when I mess up. He still embraces me in my, my messiness. We acknowledge this morning that he is good. The redeemed of the Lord should say so, because we've seen the goodness of God. Sometimes in our interactions with each other and with talking with other people as they come and go, we, we may find people, they say something like this, wow, uh, you know, the Lord was so good to me this week. Or the Lord was so good to me, he did this. Or the Lord was so good, this, that happened. Now, what do we mean when we say that? Does that, does that mean that God hasn't been good the other weeks? Does, uh, have we missed something? I'd like to suggest maybe that, that, that God truly is good all the time and that perhaps we just need to have a greater awareness of that goodness, uh, uh, to have our eyes open to the ongoing, everyday, moment by moment, goodness of God towards us. We just maybe haven't been aware of that goodness. Or we haven't seen, and perhaps this happens, sometimes we perceive things to be bad, but then we find out at some point in the future or some point down the road that we find that what whoever or whatever, whatever we looked at that we thought was a bad thing, God actually meant that for good. And it was actually something that accomplished amazing things in our lives and in our walks with him. Let me suggest another verse this morning to look at. This morning, consider Lamentations chapter three. This is verses 22 and 23. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions, his love fails not. 
These compassions, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is good all the time. His love and kindness towards us never cease. And that being true, then, the redeemed of the Lord should be in the perpetual state of giving thanks and of praising him and of saying so because we are knowing the continued blessings of God moment by moment, day by day. God is good. God is loving. God is gracious to us, and he is merciful. If you want to put that all together, in some sense, you kind of put together, you just... You just kind of shared the gospel, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God that he has showered upon us. He is so good. Now, what I want to do this morning, have you look over in Titus chapter 3. I'm going to skip around a little in my notes here and, and hit the, the, uh, the big points if you would. But over in Titus chapter 3, there's a glimpse of the way that the love of God, the grace, the mercy of God, these things, his faithfulness kind of all fit together. This is Titus chapter 3 verses 4, and we're going to look down through verse 8 of that passage of scripture as, um, as Paul is writing uh, to Titus. This is what he says. He says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we had done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works, these things are good and profitable to men. If you read through this passage of scripture over and over again, there's a lot to really kind of mine out here. But again and again and again, you see the issue of love, you see the issue of grace, you see the issue of mercy, you see the issue of faithfulness. And when he comes down to the, the last part there where he says, this is faithfulness. This is a faithful saying. One great study that you could do if you want to do something different for your quiet time at some point is to look at the different places in the letters of Paul in the New Testament, the different places where that phrase, this is is a faithful saying is used. It's a great study on some of just the basics of, of, of Christianity. This is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. This is a good word. Paul says, this is a good word for you. Hold on to it. Embrace it. Take it to heart. So here is three things from this passage, Titus chapter three, three things about the goodness of God. The first thing that we see about the goodness here is that Jesus is the expression of the kindness and love of God for mankind. That Jesus is the expression of that love and that kindness. If you would, Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's goodness. That he would not leave us separated from himself, that he would not leave us lost in sin. Is the, is the most magnanimous, the biggest expression of goodness. Not only did he do a good thing, but it's just, it comes right out of his person, the very character of God. His love is a, a covenantal and unconditional, a committed love. It's the kind of love that never ceases. And when he gave us Christ, when the kindness and love of God our Savior, Titus chapter 3 verse 4, toward man appeared, when Jesus appeared by works of righteousness which we had done, not by those, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Who is this, who is, what is this kindness and love of God, this expression? When that, what's the appearing? It's Jesus. When the very goodness of God was enfleshed, it was Christ. Jesus is the expression of the kindness and the love of God. The second thing we see here is that God's mercy is the impetus for this. God's mercy is the impetus for this. It says, but according to his mercy, he saved us. According to his mercy, according to his desire to not give us what we really deserved. His desire was to not give us what we deserve. We know this, we, and perhaps you've heard these things before because it moves on in verse, um, verse six. God's grace provides our justification. Mercy pushes him to send Christ. He doesn't want to give us what we deserve, this, this judgment of death and its separation from him. But grace provides our justification, the fixing of our relationship. 
Grace is the receiving of that which we don't deserve. Mercy is the not receiving what we do deserve. It's the message of the gospel, and it's good. And you know what? The redeemed of the Lord should say so. That's why the gospel in its, in its New Testament, in its, in its meaning, is what? Good news. It's good news that God loves you. It's good news that he sent his only son for you. It's good news in the midst of your sin that he paid the price for that, that he shed his precious blood for you. It's good news that he rose again. It's good news that we have the strength through the power of his spirit to walk and to live in a way that pleases him that we never had before. It's good news. And the redeemed of the Lord should declare that. So his love, his grace, his mercy, it it holds it all together and he is good. There's so many different places in the scriptures where we see this, this goodness, this kindness, this love expressed, particularly in the Psalms. He says, give thanks to the Lord, he is good. He's been merciful to you. He has shown his grace to you. So let me ask you this, how then do we express that? How do we do that? Well, we do that by being thankful people. We should be the kind of people who can't help but give thanks. So this morning, the question is, are you thankful? Are you thankful? Are you thankful for what he's done? And if so, let the redeemed of the Lord, Psalm 107, say so. What does a thankful person do? What's the importance of thankfulness? Well, let's pick that up. These are three things that thankful people do. These are three things that thankfulness does in our heart and in our lives. The first thing is is that that thankfulness, it it glorifies God as the source of, of every good gift. When we say thank you to God, we acknowledge that he's the source of these gifts. We as the redeemed, we ought to in every situation, every, every place, every gratitude on God for every good gift. James writes in James chapter one in verse 17 this, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift, it's from above. It comes down from the father of lights from whom there is no variation or shadow or turning. Who is the source of every gift that we enjoy? God is. And we're thankful, we glorify him, give thanks to the Lord, he is good. So many places in the Psalms, Psalm 105. Psalm 105 is a great place to go. Psalm 105 is a great place to go um, to look at some of the things that we should be giving thanks to the Lord for. I was gonna use it on the back of your insert this, uh, this morning as the place for your kind of Bethany at home study, but I didn't. I thought Psalm 136 was a better place to go. But if you want to, you can look at Psalm 105. Psalm 105 begins with, if you would, 10 commands. We are commanded to do 10 things in the beginning of Psalm 105. And the first is this, is to give thanks to the Lord. Right out the gate, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name, make known his deeds, sing to him, speak of his wonders, glory in his name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the strength of the Lord, seek him continually, remember his deeds. Train your heart. Train your heart. If we're going to glorify him, train your heart to see the things where God is at work. To think of God working in everything. To think of him working in everything. Now, I want you to understand that I use the word in everything purposely. Because let's just be honest, there are some things that it's either really hard to give thanks for, or there are some things that we shouldn't give thanks for. There are some things that we should not give thanks for that happen because they are out out of the scope, out of the keeping of God's will. They're just evil, they're wrong. That's why I think it's important to notice when scripture speaks of the giving of thanks, it, it says to give thanks in things, not for them. Some of you may be going through some things in your life and you're saying, gosh, that just stinks. It really does. And it makes it really hard. It's much better, it's much more, I think, appropriate to give thanks in them, not for them. 
because in them, through them, God is going to do something, and perhaps even likely something you never ever expected. Being thankful glorifies the Lord. The second thing that we see here is that being thankful turns the obligation of religion into the joy of relationship. The obligation of religion becomes the joy of relationship. When I'm forced to give thanks, when I have to do it in order to meet up to a certain thing or to jump over a certain hoop or attain a new level, if I have to do something like that, sometimes it just robs the joy of it. But when I give thanks, it, it, takes, it takes the religion out of it and, it, and it, it allows me to celebrate the relationship. One of the hardest things to do as a pastor is to do a funeral for someone you don't know. And oftentimes, uh, over the years that I've been in ministry, I've received a call from a funeral home or from a family who say, you know, would you be able to or would you be available to do a service? And, and there's certain things you really can't say no to just because you know they are an opportunity to bring the comfort and to bring the gospel into a situation. And, and sometimes when you sit down with a family, one of the things that you'll find or that I found that they've said is that, well, they weren't very religious. And I've had to kind of come to grips with, well, what do you say when somebody says that to you? And particularly when you don't know them or know the background of the, the person. And so what I kind of landed on was this idea and the idea is this, well, that's okay because religion is overrated. Religion is overrated. And God's desire for us is not to go through the hoops or religion. God's desire for us is to have a relationship and for us to be involved with him and to get to know him and for him to be a part of our life and for us to welcome him in. And, 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 and that changes the whole direction, it changes the whole, it skews things a completely different way. When I view things as religious or an act of my religion, I, I have to, it robs it of the joy. But when I focus on the things that he's done and when I am thankful to him, it allows me to celebrate the relationship rather than the religion of it. So many of the Psalms, again, focus on this issue of relationship. Psalm 106, Psalm 107, Psalm 118, Psalm 136 that you look at this week, over and over and over and again. It is giving thanks because of a relationship giving thanks because of a relationship. And so here's our transforming truth for today, just very simply. The joy of relationship with Jesus is the wellspring of a grateful heart. The joy of relationship with Jesus is the wellspring of a grateful heart. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you should be some of the most joyful people. You shouldn't be sour. You shouldn't be a griper. You shouldn't be a complainer. You should be someone who exudes joy and, and just allows joy to shine out of your life into the others because that relationship with Jesus, the redeemed of the Lord, they do what? They say so. They are a wellspring, a wellspring of gratefulness and of joy. Let me suggest thirdly, being thankful leads to a joy-filled, to a God-focused life. Being thankful leads us to a joy-filled, God-focused life. We focus on him. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Again, what do we? In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We give thanks in all things because God is God. He is sovereign. He is good. He does not forsake us. His love is everlasting. We are the recipients of his grace, of his mercy. He is faithful to us each and every day. In everything we give thanks. This is his will. Let me close this morning with just four suggestions I'm going to say for gratitude. The first is this, is that I want to encourage you to just spend some time this week to stop and to think. To stop and to think. 
and to just reflect on things, places, areas, times where God has been good. I want to suggest to you this. If you think, you will thank. If you think, you will thank. If you think about the ways that God has worked in your life, you will become a th- you'll, you'll say, God, you have been so good. Thank you. Stop and think this week. Second, let me suggest this, to express your gratitude daily. Not just this week, but every week. Don't deny the reality of his working. Take the moment to praise and to express gratitude on a daily basis for the ways that he is working in your life. Hear yourself say those things, reflect on those things. Every Tuesday when we get together for a prayer meeting, we start with praise. Well, we actually, most of the time, start with a little devotional about prayer. But we always take the time to reflect back on the ways that God has worked. Why? Because when we see that God has worked, we get excited and we say, gosh, let's pray more. Let's trust God for more. You should join us on Tuesday night. You should join us. There's ministry happens on Tuesday night around the table in classroom A just as much as any other time of the week, perhaps even more than this hour you're spending in here today. Because we look to God and we say, God, work, we need you. It's a, it's a statement of humility, of dependence upon him. And so we express our gratitude daily and we reflect on his work. Let me suggest third, look for the good and gracious hand of God. Look for those things. Thank you so much to um, Wendy for sharing that verse. Again, it's here. Brethren, whatever things, oh no, I'm sorry, this is not the right verse. Sorry about that. I, I got a little ahead of myself. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things pure, whatever things lovely, whatever things that are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on the scene, think on these things. Because what, when you stop and think, you thank. Paul doesn't want to avoid the hard things or difficult things or deny them, but he does want us to look for the good things and he wants us to remember them. There isn't a bad thing that happens that if handled correctly doesn't lead to a good thing. There isn't a bad thing that happens if handled correctly that doesn't lead to a good thing. And then finally, regularly worship God. Regularly worship God. Spend time with the Lord. Spend time with his people. That's why that song, I I know it's old. I know, come you thankful people, that's old. It's okay, it has wonderful thoughts, and one of them is this. Come ye thankful people, come, and raise your voices of thanksgiving for the things that God has done. Focus on and regularly worship God. Sometimes so many stuff, so much stuff happens in our lives. It's so easy to, for, for the time, for time of the body to be together, kind of gets pushed aside. You ought to just mark that off on your calendar. Sunday, Sunday morning, it's all, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm booked. Sorry, I can't. I've got a prior engagement. Oh, I just said, no. I can't reschedule that. There's not a single Sunday that you can reschedule. Because once Sunday is here, it's here and gone. So don't miss it. Regularly worship God and see if God doesn't do something in your heart. Oh, there's a little verse there. I'm not even sure what it is. Oh, Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to God, to the God of heaven for his mercy endures forever. So this week, let me encourage you to reflect on the goodness of God, to reflect on the fact that he not only does good things, but is good himself. That we, as the redeemed of the Lord, are the beneficiaries of love and of grace and of mercy, the daily beneficiaries of his faithfulness to us. And that as we pursue him and as we give thanks to him, he is glorified. And our relationship, the perspective on our relationship with him changes it. It, 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 it makes it sweeter and more wonderful. And we look to him and we say, God, thank you. And as we grow in thanks, we become a beacon, a light to the people around us of joy. 
the joy of the Lord. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up this morning. And we're going to close with a song. And the song is going to be our benediction this morning. You're dismissed after the song. The words of the song are from 10,000 uh, 10, Reasons. I, I, at least, if we were to take the time, at least 10,000 reasons to express our gratitude to the Lord. Thank you so much for being here today to express your thanksgiving. We hope you'll stay for the next step group. We hope that you'll stay and have a cup of coffee. We hope that you'll take a moment to greet those around you and to wish them a wonderful week of gratitude to our great God. He is good. Will you stand? Please stand and join.